Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Dr. Mark Gomez, but you can call me Dr. G. And welcome to Health 360 with Dr. G. Tonight on the show, I am so excited. You guys got to get this. Here we go. Today's topic, shh, is it normal? Health issues women avoid talking about. That's right. Shh, is it normal? health issues women avoid talking about. This show is always about you. Everything that we do on Health360 with Dr. G is to make you better at what you do. The goals are always still the same. I want you to have the resources to be the best version of yourself each and every day. I want you to subscribe to the foundations of lifestyle medicine and apply them on a daily basis because our daily choices matter more than most of us realize. So when we talk about things like sleeping better, eating better, moving more, stressing less, having the mind-body connection, make social connections. Those are still the foundations of everything we do. Remember that when you have success in your health, you're going to have success in your life. So welcome everybody. Health 360 with Dr. G. My name is Dr. Mark Gomez. Again, you can call me Dr. G. Check me out on my website, www.health360podcast.com. Follow me across all social media at health 360 w Dr. G. My guests today are fierce. I'm so excited for you to meet them and help you break things down. But of course, I want you guys to do a couple of things for me. Number one, grab a pen. There you go. Grab a pen and grab some paper. And it can be any paper that you want. And I want you to take notes. This show is for you. And guess what? Even though we're going to be talking about some key topics related to women's health today, because again, shh. Is it normal? We're going to talk about that. But fellas, you guys out there, fellas, you can learn something too. So grab a pen and paper. We're all about hashtag lifelong learning. Today's topic is going to be so much fun. And I cannot wait for you to meet my guests. Before we dive into that, let me hit you with a quick disclaimer. The content of Health 360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast, is for your information and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So, oh my goodness, I'm so excited. When I was planning this show, I had the right people to help me out, not only to help me, but also to help you out too. These two docs that I have on today, they're at the tops of their games, and I tell them to that oft, often. But they're so humble at what they do, but they truly care about the people that they serve. And again, what I would always want to do is make sure that I want you guys to leverage my network, leverage me, leverage you, you know your colleagues, uh, leverage Dr. Derry and Dr. Dennis, who you're going to meet in a few moments. We, we're all here to help you out. And remember, if you have any questions, it is important for you to talk to your doctor. He or she will help you through anything that comes up. Again, we all are here to help you out. Again, it takes a village. So let's talk about it. So I want to introduce my guest today, my first guest. On today's topic, health issues women avoid talking about. Love it. My, I want to introduce my friend, longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Saisha Dennis, MD, MPH, FAAFP. She's assistant professor, Department of Family and Community Medicine, Community Medicine Curriculum Director at University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Dr. Dennis, welcome to the show. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Hey, it's, it's awesome to have you here. Briefly, tell us about yourself. Where did you go to where'd you go to school? I'm not going to leak it. You can leak it. Where did you go to school? Where did you do your residency? And a few uh, opening remarks about the importance of today's conversation. Yeah, so um, I am originally from Oklahoma. So that's where I was born. I was born in Oklahoma City. Um, I ventured off for college. So I actually went to a women's college um, in Wellesley, Massachusetts at Wellesley College. And it was really there that I kind of developed a growing interest in all things about women, um, women's rights, reproductive health, um, how women can be success successful in general. And then um, I went to med school with Dr. G. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We met on that first day of orientation. Love it. <laughs> we did. We did. Like love um, friends. It just feels like yesterday, even That's though it was... Though. Quite a while ago. Well, well, I've aged a ton. You haven't aged at all. You see all this gray on my face and everything, but it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> where, did you, where did you do your residency? And, and uh, tell yeah, us a little bit about you. Think about yeah. more about this topic. 
Yeah, I did my residency at West Suburban in family medicine. So I became a family doctor there in Chicago. And then I moved back home and I've been practicing family medicine in Tulsa, Oklahoma for the last 10 years. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Dr. Dennis, for coming on to the show today. Uh, we're going to get granular in a few moments. There's no doubt about that. I want to introduce to everybody my next guest. She and I are longtime friends, too. We met actually uh, within this last decade, and we actually worked together at the hospital, and uh, we started serving on committees together. And then our relationship just blossomed thereafter. So I want to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Kimberly Derry, MD, uh, F-A-C-O-G. Dr. Derry is a board-certified obstetrician and gynecologist. She's the chief medical officer at Elmer's Hospital, part of Edward Elmer's Health. Dr. Derry, welcome to the show. Great seeing you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gomez, for inviting me. And I'm so happy to be here and share some uh, knowledge and and hopefully do some uh, good to the community. Oh, there's no doubt about that. Give me your origin story. Everybody's got an origin story. Go ahead and give your origin story. Yeah. Uh, where you're from, where you did med school, residency, and a few opening remarks about mm -hmm. today's topic. Sure. Well, um, I am uh, a native Chicagoan, and uh, I, I went to undergrad at uh, Xavier University of Louisiana in New Orleans. Um, I had always wanted to be in science, actually, um, became a chemist after, after college. And I was a chemist for seven years. Um, and then I kind of went back to what I really wanted to do, which is to go into medicine. Um, I, I did my um, um, medical school at uh, Ross and Franklin, uh, Chicago Medical School it was called back then. And I did my residency at uh, St. Joseph Hospital uh, in uh, Lincoln Park in Chicago. So I've been at Elmhurst, uh, at Elmhurst um, for over 10 years, and um, I am currently uh, moved up in the administrative role and, and uh, been uh, very, very happy. So Wonderful. Well, let's go get it. So how the show works, you guys just met my amazing guest, how it works. I ask the questions and they supply the answers. What's up with that? And guess what, everybody? I actually might participate in the answering myself today. We'll see how it is. My show, I get to make the rules and everything, but no, we are here in all seriousness. We are here to help you out again. Grab that pen, grab that paper, and again, let's do this. So how I've got this set up, I'm gonna ask some questions, and we're gonna cover a couple different broad categories, but this is really, this show is really about kind of almost like a miss versus facts within miss versus facts. We're gonna set the record straight. We're gonna ask some common questions, of course, based on different topics like preventive medicine, uh, cancer prevention, heart disease. We're gonna talk pregnancy contraception. We're gonna talk perimenopause, menopause, and we're gonna talk sexual health because we've got to talk all about these things. Again, when it comes to you having a conversation with your doctor, yes, number one, you wanna have that trust in your doc. But again, for us as physicians, there's nothing that's off limits. We can't help out unless we know what's going on. So thank you for everybody. So let's do it. All right, here we go. First question, we're gonna talk about prevention, anti-cancer, you know, screening. These are important things that come in our, in our offices, our medical practice on a daily basis. First question goes to Dr. Dennis, here we go. What measures can a woman take to prevent breast cancer? Well, I mean, I think just in terms of any cancers, the biggest things that we need to do is to be taking care of our health overall. So that means exercising, keeping our health, uh, our weight in a healthy range and limiting the alcohol in intake that we have, um, making sure that we're doing our regular screenings with our doctors, um, getting anything that comes up checked, right? So if you feel something abnormal, you go to your doctor, you get it checked out. Um, but in general, cancer prevention is about taking care of yourself. It's about lifestyle medicine. So that's taking care of your mental well-being, your physical well-being, being mindful of what you're putting into your body if you're trying to prevent cancer. Wonderful. And I agree. And right now we know the risk for breast cancer. One in eight women in this country are at risk for breast cancer. And it's so important to have these conversations. Uh, I was talking to a colleague of mine not too long ago. She told me in the county where we practice, only about 30 to 40% of women that are eligible for mammograms actually get them done. So we have a huge gap in trying to screen people for something that can be treatable if we identify it early. So thanks, Dr. Dennis. Dr. Terry, here we go. Here's a question. I get this question asked all the time. When should I get my first mammogram and how often are they needed? What do you got to tell your patients when you see them? 
Well, you know, that is actually um, a very controversial topic because there are uh, the American Cancer Society says um, one age, the uh, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology say another, um, and then we have uh, a, a US task force that says another. Um, but at, at least we know for sure that women over 50 should, it, w once you turn 50, you should get a mammogram. Um, there is some uh, dialogue about starting mammograms earlier, like at, at age 40. Once again, that's something to talk to your doctor about because um, some people have risk factors that may cause them to have to get mammograms sooner. Um, if it runs in your family, there's definitely some protocols to get uh, early screening. And if you've had certain, there are other types of cancers, for instance, or other types of medication that you're on that could cause you to uh, have to want to get your breast looked at sooner. And for sure, if you have any type of lump, bump, something that's not, that seems weird or, or unusual, to see your doctor right away so that that could get looked at. And most women do get mammograms just when they do have some type of mass in their breast. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Derry. And you, you hit the head on the nail. It's, it's important to have that conversation. If you feel you're right, you've got to take action. We'd rather give reassurance to women than not to, uh, than, than to you know, certainly have to have that conversation about breast cancer. So reassurance is everything. And this really comes back to people. I want you out there at home that's listening to continue to take charge of your health. You've got this. Myself, Dr. Dennis, Dr. Dear, we believe in you and don't be afraid to bring things up. I'm going to ask this question and you know, I'm going to take this one. Here we go. Why not? I said I was going to participate. I'm feeling the love today. <laughs> so why not? I got my two longtime friends, but uh, no, I might participate. This might be the only time. Here we go. I'm going to ask myself this question. Here's a common question I get asked. All right. What types of food can women eat to help reduce their risk of breast cancer? So I'll answer it this way. Um, some of us have heard of the term the blue zones. The blue zones are, the, are places on earth where people live the longest. They have the least amount of disease burden, the, long, the, the extreme longevity, the least amount of health issues at all, as, all, as well. And so if you're looking at things that promote longevity, and we're talking about again, cancer, that, that is certainly real, and cancer is the number two, death, number two cause of death, uh, all cause mortality in this country behind cardiovascular disease. We're looking at foods that help you out. Here are the four best foods, I'll say, for longevity, because who doesn't want longevity? And when you eat these foods, you're getting properties that help the body heal. So number one, 100% whole grain uh, farro, quinoa, brown rice, bulgur, which is cracked wheat, oatmeal, whole cornmeal. Number two, fruits and vegetables. You got to do it. Uh, the recommended consumption is five to 10 servings a day, but probably we all need a little bit more. Number three, nuts. A handful of nuts a day will go a long way. And number four, beans. Legumes miss us, everybody. And so I think not only from a cancer benefit, but cardiovascular, weight stabilization, blood sugar stabilization, eat a beans as much as possible. So here we go. Next question. I like this one. Let's talk about pap smears. I'll go back to Dr. Derry on this one. Dr. Derry, when should a woman start getting pap smears? So uh, there have been some uh, new recommendations that have come out um, before, it, you know, there, there were, uh, there's been a lot of misconceptions about that. And they keep pushing back some of the, uh, the age ranges for pap smears. So by the age of 21, you should get a pap smear. Um, and, and actually uh, what they found was that getting pap smears younger than that may actually cause uh, a little bit more um, at, uh, cells that may show up that actually kind of come and go. So, um, but I will say that um, there are some, once again, some other circumstances where people may, uh, this, that you're talking with your doctor to find out when you should get a pap smear um, because we, we keep pushing things out a little bit further and further because um, we wanna make sure that we are targeting the right age group. More importantly now is the HPV screen, which um, we are encouraging young women to get uh, the HPV um, vaccination. Uh, for young, for boys and girls. And uh, that's another very important thing too, um, because HPV can, um, first of all, the vaccine can help prevent HPV and HPV we know does have a direct link to cervical cancer. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Dennis, when you're seeing, when you're seeing um, young teenage girls in your practice, um, you know, how are you having these kind of conversations? Some of them might show up with their mother uh, in their practice, although now, you know, uh, uh, certainly being a minor, but how do you kind of start that conversation when people start say, hey, you know what, we need to be talking not only vaccine, but also pap smear? Yeah, I mean, 
mean, I think that it's, you know, I've kind of uh, kind of trained and then grown up in kind of this evolving um, recommendations. Um, so pushing that back up to 21, um, spreading out the screenings to every three years to now every, uh, every five years after you're 30. And so I think um, a lot of the times with my young women, we're talking about um, screening for sexually transmitted infections, how to prevent HPV, getting those vaccinations that, so that they can be as healthy as possible to when we're starting those screenings at 21. And sometimes you'll have parents that'll come in and they'll say, hey, you know, you know, my daughter is sexually active. Should we start getting those screenings right now? And they start now. And so we have to update them on the current um, science, understanding about how cervical cancer evolves, the HPV vaccine, the HPV, how it influences cervical cancer. And so a lot of times, just like with the mammogram screenings, it's really about having a conversation with your pa patients um, and their parents so that you get that understanding about where we are in the medical community in terms of taking care of health. Because it is, it does change a lot. I think that's a great thing about uh, us as, as, as physicians that, you know, it's, we, we task ourselves to stay up to date on sometimes a revolving door of recommendations and guidelines, but we all try to do best practices. And so um, that's why I think it's so important to have that foundation with your doc. Speaking of docs, I get this question asked a lot. Uh, so I would ask a question to Dr. Derry. Dr. Derry, you've taken care of countless patients over the years. Uh, sometimes what'll happen when people come in to see me, I might be their first quote unquote primary care physician that they've had in, in years. Uh, they've actually been seeing their OBGYN as their PCP. Uh, do you recommend that women uh, have in a piece, stay with an OBGYN as their PCP? Or do you recommend that women should be seeing a family practitioner or an internist like myself? Well, uh, you know, I, I, that, that's kind of, um, that's a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I put you on the spot a little bit. I like right, it. Right. Because that's I have why a, I like a medicine you. doc on the uh, here. We have a family practice, family medicine doc and an OBGYN. <laughs> so here's what I will say. Uh, there are some OBGYNs out there that truly really invest a lot of their time and energy doing primary care. Okay. Um, and that, that is a reality. Now, uh, many OBGYNs really like to stick with obstetrics and gynecology and kind of make sure, especially when we're talking about like maintenance medications. So like if you are, have diabetes or you have thyroid disorder, those kinds of things, heart, you know, high blood pressure. Um, most of the time, it's really important to kind of have more of a real rounded uh, a physician that can actually manage all of those other medications. What I will say is if there is an OBGYN that really feels comfortable, you know, working with all of those other meds, that's great. If they do have to give uh, some of that off to another type of doctor, like an internal medicine doc or a family practice doc, what I will say is being in the same system is super helpful. So like, for instance, a lot of people will have their OBGYN in one health system and then have their medicine doctor in another health system. So if something goes wrong, then both doctors don't know what has happened and what's gone on. So being in the same health system makes a difference. And so if you want to stay with your OBGYN, but say your, your, med your uh, medical condition changes where it gets more complicated and you need to go to uh, a, a, you know, a regular um, pr primary care doc, have them in the same system so they can communicate. Yes. And I, I'm a big proponent of that. Wonderful, well, thank you. Let's talk now hearts of, uh, heart disease. Uh, we know it's gotta be talked about more and more. Here we are almost at February next month. And we know in this country, every February is American Heart Awareness Month. Uh, something that we don't talk often about is certainly for women's heart health. Uh, Dr. Dennis, where, where, do we, where do we start having this conversation to, to really get the message across that women are just as much at risk for heart disease as men. Uh, some may argue that, they're, that the data on number of women having heart disease is actually a little bit higher than men. Uh, but again, that's the data kind of, kind of goes back and forth. But, but where do you start having these conversations to get women to know about heart disease risks? I mean, I think, again, we, you have to start with, um, with talking to your primary care doctor. And we need to have a conversation about what it means to have a healthy heart. How do you develop that from, you know, starting as a child through your teenage years and then grow into kind of those healthy eating habits, exercise, 
all those different food groups that you just talked about. Um, I think for women, I mean, heart disease is the number one cause of death for women. So it's still a big, it's a big issue that women don't think as much about as we do our breast cancers or our other gynecological cancers that we may focus on. But it's, it's the number one cause of death for women. And so obviously it's a huge thing in terms of keeping yourself healthy is to think about some of those things that you can, risk factors that may lead you to have heart disease. So hypertension, diabetes, all those things um, that increase your risk of having heart disease um, or heart attacks later on in life. You now, one of the things that I talk about a lot with my patients is, uh, is, I, is I, I tell, certainly yes, I love what you're saying. We have to have these conversations about heart disease. It is the number one killer. The interesting thing is when we think from a lifestyle medicine scope, we say heart disease can be prevented. You're right. You're talking about laying the foundation in the youth. Uh, going back to the blue zones that I mentioned a little bit ago, we look at some of those populations and they have virtually no heart disease. They're actually populous in the earth in rural China or in, in the indigenous populations in Mexico where they haven't had a case of a heart attack in decades. They just haven't seen it. And so, yes, can we get to those points? We can aspire, of course, to get to those points, but it starts by having the conversation. One of the things that I'm doing a lot in my practice now, when I see women and we start talking about heart disease, and, they, and again, February, Heart Awareness Month, everybody, we got to keep talking about it. Uh, one of the things that I do is I send people for heart scans. Uh, and uh, it's one of the best tests out there to screen for cardiovascular disease. Now, of course, we're looking at not, we're looking at one data point. There's a, we have to continue to talk about the totality of a person, but I love doing heart scans. Uh, we're not going to dive into heart scans too much today because I'm actually going to be doing a show about cardiovascular testing in, in several weeks from now. But I want you, if you're listening right now, if you haven't had a heart scan, if you're a woman and you're over the age of 45 and you haven't had a heart scan, talk to your doc about getting one done. All right, I want to ask this question to Dr. Hey, Mark, I just, yeah, wanted to, I just wanted to mention one other thing too, because I think it's right super important is with, with heart disease, know your family history. Because I think what the main problem that people have is they don't know that, you know, yeah, your grandmother might've died of breast cancer, but she had had two heart attacks already. You like a lot of things happen. And a lot of times people uh, have this myth that heart attacks and, and heart disease and cardiac disease is an older person's disease and not that it can't happen to younger people. And we all know we've seen young people have strokes in their 30s and 40s. So I just wanted to mention that as well, just knowing your family history, because a lot of times that can actually lead for you to get some um, more closer attention that your doctor may take with you, knowing that, you know, everyone in your family had heart attacks under the age of 50. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you hit that on there. We have to have those conversations. So thanks for reemphasizing that point and, and really stressing that uh, we have to take this as an opportunity. Remember those days like when we were, you know, when you're young and, you know, you might be talking, you, you don't, you don't really get into family history like you probably should have. I remember growing up, you know, uh, we, you know, unfortunately you might be at a, at a funeral and, and you're at the repast. You say, you know, I remember a kid, what happened? And then, you know, in our culture, you know, sometimes they say the little kids got to get out the room. This is grown folk, grown folk talk. And so, you know, you miss that opportunity to ask those kind of questions, but we shouldn't be afraid to ask those questions. What happened? As you said, Dr. Jerry, what happened to grandma? What happened to mom? And you might unearth a clue that might actually help that person have that better conversation with their doc. Right. Yeah, for sure. Because I think sometimes, you know, sometimes, you know, my, my great grandfather, we don't know how he died, but we know that it was a sudden death, but it certainly has been a clue for me to think about risk factors for my own health, right? So mm -hmm. if I have underlying uh, high cholesterol, other risk factors for a heart attack or, uh, or stroke in the future. Um, so sometimes just picking up, the, telling your doctor those small points about your family history to give them clues about potential risk for you, yourself. Let's talk about exercise because here we are in the new year. A lot of people use these slogans, new year, new you. I know I'm using it. <laughs> There's no doubt <laughs> about that. Uh, but, but think of it as an opportunity. You know, we could talk exercise uh, all day, but let's go ahead and just make the point. Uh, why is being physically active important? I'll start with you, Dr. Jerry. Go ahead and make the point. Why is exercise uh, an important thing to engage in? And then how, how do women who may have not engaged in exercise, how do they do it? How, where do you start? Yeah, well, you know, I will tell you that uh, that actually was my story. And um, I was 
you know, so too busy, quote unquote, too busy to exercise. And um, what, um, and I was, I ended up working with a coach and I realized that um, how important exercise is. And, and sometimes we think of exercise, you, you think you got to put the sweatband on your head and start getting barbells and all that kind of stuff. And what I realized was just that everyone walks. I mean, well, I won't say everyone walks, but I'm saying if, if you can walk and you're mobile, you can at least walk. And I realized that I started picking up my walking pace and then I started, you know, moving further and further beyond that and, uh, you know, did treadmill stuff. And so I guess my point is that it's super important to at least move, do something, you know, um, it, unfortunately with the COVID and most of us are kind of cooped up at home. It's even worse now because we're not able to even get outside and enjoy the outdoors as much as we normally like to or go places where we can walk around. But um, it is very important. It's, it's great for uh, heart health. And it, and it actually helps clear your mind. You know, we, we sometimes always think about exercise, about building up and bulking up and all of that, getting guns, you know, in your arms and all of that. But the realities are that it's so important really for your heart and also for just a calm down. There are people that participate in a lot of other types of things and activities to, to, to get a mind rest. And a lot of people can use that with walking, running, exercise, uh, aerobics, all of that can really just help take you to another level. I love it. Dr. Dennis, how are you telling women in your practice to stay physically active? I mean, I think one of the things that we can use is this, this tool right here, right? Yeah. So we all have this phone and it's counting our steps and it's telling us how much did we, to, we get up today? Did we walk up a flight of stairs? Um, sometimes it's just about reflecting on how active or inactive that you are. We know and we're, we've gotten more studies to show that being sedentary is bad for your heart. Um, it increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. And so we know that moving around, getting up, using those standing desks, taking a 15 minute walk every four hours or during your work day, especially as many of us are working from home, we get used to sitting in these chairs, right? And not moving around. We need to kind of push ourselves to move. So using those smartphones, collecting the data about our activity levels and just steadily increasing it, setting small goals. This week, I'm gonna take a walk for 15 minutes, you know, and then the next week I'm gonna increase that by another 15 minutes. And then just steadily increasing to your building up to more, um, maybe more um, intense activity like running or jogging or um, swimming, things that are um, more cardiovascularly intensive, but just walking is so good for your health. Wonderful. Wait, take it, help you with your mental health too. You're right about the mental, the, the, the mental, the, 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 the endorphins that we get, dopamine being released as a reward system. And you can really thrive. You can really set the tone. And it's like, you know, some of those days if you wake, you wake up in the morning, you're like, all right, I exercise. And you're like, you kind of, you kind of feel good that day. Now you might crash <laughs> later on throughout the day. Don't get me wrong, but you feel good for that moment. You're like, all right, I did it. Being intentional is everything we are talking about being successful with your health and well-being. Let's switch topics. Let's go pregnancy and contraception. Get a lot of questions about this. So here we go. First question to Dr. Derry. Here we go. Uh, can you bleach your hair while pregnant? What's your take on that? Yeah, that's the age old question we get. And uh, I will tell you that, um, yeah, back in the day, um, you know, many hair products were had a lot of toxic uh, um, ingredients in it. Um, but these days, especially now with the, the wave of people being healthy and getting away from harsh chemicals, um, it is okay. Now, some people still don't. And I, you, you get the great, you know, woman with full head of gray hair pregnant. And it's like, you know, you can, it's okay to go ahead and get your hair dyed. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a big proponent of looking at ingredients. If you're getting your hair dyed with a stylist, just make sure that person is using um, um, products that, uh, that are non-toxic. Wonderful. Here's the next question. Dr. Dennis, I like this one. How, this is what I, I get asked and I might actually defer to the, uh, to my OBGYN partners on this one, but here's a, here's a question uh, for some of my younger moms out there. Um, how long do you have to wait to breastfeed after drinking alcohol? Do you ever get that kind of question asked to you? <laughs> uh, yeah, so they all uh, pump and dump. Um, so uh, yeah, I may defer to Dr. Derry on this for like specific hours, but most women, They'll go out to eat or maybe they ha they'll have one drink. 
and then they'll um, they'll go ahead and just um, breast use the breast pump um, to get rid of that milk, and then um, usually after that they should be good to go with breastfeeding. It, I mean, obviously, it's going to depend on how much alcohol you took. So, a moderate <laughs> amount of alcohol, you know, the breast pump, and, and you should be good later. I got you on that one, Dr. Darren. What do you tell some of your your patients and everything? Yeah, the same thing. I said, you know what? Everyone needs a break if that's something that that you know will make you make you feel like you're having a good time. But once again, I agree with the volume, the amount of alcohol for sure, um, and then. Um, I, you know, just because people, you know, when it comes to like, oh, two hours, three hours, you know, I always say that next feeding, you know, because for the most part, most babies by that time, you know, they're, they're feeding every few hours. So I kind of say like, you know, dump, dump the milk for that feeding. And then, you know, the next feeding you can, if you're still breastfeeding, you know, with breast, uh, you can give the baby breast milk. There's no like hardcore science about it. Once again, because, you know, you being conscientious of the amount of alcohol that you're intaking, you know, you have to take that into consideration as well. Excellent. Here we go. Next question. I'll come at you on this one, Dr. Derry. Here we go. In what trimester can you fly while pregnant and when should you stop flying? Okay. I absolutely love this question. And I will tell you that um, uh, I had a colleague tell me this years ago and it's always stuck with me and I share this with patients. Um, I know everyone, you know, the, the baby magazines and new pregnancy magazines talk about a baby moon and all of that. And here's all I will say is this first trimester, you know, um, you know, traveling either in the first trimester, um, when we start to get to the, once you get past about 23, 24 weeks, wherever you go, that baby potentially can live outside of you. What does that mean? You might be stuck in Costa Rica or you might be stuck in Aruba if you bag breaks on the plane because that is something that's completely unpredictable. You'll be stuck in Aruba for three months for your baby to be in the NICU in Aruba. So understand those things, okay? Because pregnancy is not something that we can control. It, it actually is something that happens to you that's happening to you that you cannot control. Although you can have the most healthiest pregnancy on the planet, be the healthiest person on the planet, can your back can break spontaneously at 28 weeks for absolutely no reason. And whatever, when that happens, you you can't get back on a plane and come home, okay? You have to stay there until the baby's born. And most of the time the baby's gonna be premature and you're in the uh, beautiful Costa Rican jungle area where you, <laughs> your health, health insurance doesn't cover the, medica the, the, the medical bills. So I always put that into perspective. If you want to go somewhere, go someplace where if you get stuck there, you're not, you're not going to, you know, that, that, that you will be okay with that because life is not predictable when it comes to pregnancy. Although it, you could be the most healthiest person on the planet. There are things that can happen. That they're just way beyond your control. Thank you, Dr. Derry, for keep, just keeping it real and breaking it down like that. <laughs> See, this is why I have, this is why, I, you know, me as a doc, this is why I say, you know, it takes a village. I truly believe in my physician partners uh, and count on them for their expertise. I don't plan, I don't pretend to know all the answers and I will tell people I don't. And so this is why I love having this kind of dialogue to help you out at home who's listening. Here's the next question. Thank you, Dr. Derry. Here we go, Dr. Janice, I like this one. Um, here we go. I like this one. I, 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 have a, I, have a, I have like a cornucopia of options here to choose from. So here we go. I'm like, I'm like this, I like this one. Here we go. Uh, speaking of pregnancy and getting pregnant, um, is there, have you heard this? I mean, this is going around. People ask me, uh, is there a list of foods or a diet that will increase a woman's fertility? Do we know any truth about that? I have not heard about any particular foods that increase your fertility. Um, obviously, we know that the healthier you are, um, the healthier you are in terms of your weight and everything, the, the better able you're able to uh, get pregnant. Um, but in terms of specific foods, I haven't heard of any that will increase your fertility. Dr. Derry, I saw you shaking your head a little bit. No, <laughs> you want to you want to elaborate on that one? And again, this is where I, I you know for me, I just tell people like, listen, I just need you to be, yeah. I want you to be healthy. Um, but and then I'll say, hey, go ask your OBGYN. Uh, <laughs> but what's your take on that one? Well, and I totally agree with uh, Dr. Dennis, and I will also say that 
whatever, I, I say this a lot, whatever little medical problem you have prior to pregnancy is going to, can potentially get way, you know, way more exacerbated in pregnancy. If you have a little bit of blood pressure issues, you're probably going to have a major blood pressure issue in pregnancy. If you have a little bit of a thyroid problem, that also may flare up. Uh, so, and definitely diabetes. So my thing is the best way, I, I, there are no foods that actually help with, with fertility. But what I would say is if you are trying to get pregnant, start taking prenatal vitamins. Okay. So switch out the women's formula vitamin, go with prenatal vitamins. You can take them every day. It doesn't hurt you. Um, and so get your body geared up for that. The other thing is obviously maintaining weight is, is super important as well, because we know that extreme weight gain in pregnancy can cause a lot of complications uh, later in the, in the pregnancy. So not so much food, but definitely um, would take care of the problems that you have beforehand, because a lot of times they, they can really get really out of control in the pregnancy. Wonderful. I want to ask this last question before we move to the next topic. And this is an important one since we're in the middle of the pandemic. And one of the hottest topics right now, hands down, is the COVID-19 vaccine. So here's a question. I'll ask uh, Dr. Dennis and then Dr. Dare, if you want to chime in, you can too. But I'll ask this question to Dr. Dennis. Um, Dr. Dennis, what advice can you offer uh, pregnant women to pregnant women or those who are planning to become pregnant regarding COVID-19 vaccination? Do we have a statement about that? Yeah, so we, ACOG has come out with a recommendation that pregnant women should be offered the vaccine and it should not be withheld. Obviously, all pregnant women need to have a conversation with their doctors, um, their ob their primary care doctor to see if there's anything in their history that would um, make them more at risk for side effects from the vaccine. Um, but in terms of what um, the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, kind of the national um, physician um, leaders on taking care of pregnant women, they have said that this vaccine um, should be safe for pregnant women and should not be withheld from pregnant women because we know that pregnant women can suffer um, from severe side effects and um, uh, morbidity from COVID. Dr. Derry, are you hearing anything from your inner circles about, uh, about vaccination in pregnant women or those uh, who are planning to become pregnant? Yeah, just to echo what Dr. Dennis, absolutely, ACOG, American College of Sectors and Gynecology, also the uh, Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, which is sort of like a high risk of um, pregnancy physicians, uh, they all have come out with very strong, strong statements stating that women that are planning, that, that women that are, that are currently pregnant and women that are lactating should get the vaccine. Uh, they should have a conversation with their doctor about it, but overwhelmingly, there aren't too many conditions that would exclude any women in those categories to get the vaccine. Because what we have found is that COVID-19 in pregnant women, that they actually have work, can have some worse outcomes with COVID and being pregnant at the same time. So uh, that, that has been uh, shown in the literature. So we really want, and women that are planning to get pregnant, get the vaccine before you get pregnant. What we do know is that the mRNA, which is in the two current vaccines that are available now, uh, do not alter DNA. So I've had a lot of the people who are, had questions about, well, I'm only six weeks pregnant. I'm only 12 weeks pregnant. I don't want to get the vaccine right now. And the, and the answer to that is you can still get the vaccine um, because uh, if you are, um, um, it, it does not alter any DNA, you know, worried about like, you know, birth defects or genetic material. It's not, it's not altered with that, uh, those, those two particular uh, vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna. Wonderful. You know, you both are hitting the head that right now we're in the middle of this pandemic and we're still in the deep end of the swimming pool. You know, the, the you know, us here and I've seen you guys, I've seen y'all's pics on social media. I know y'all been vaccinated. Doc's got the shot. <laughs> Love it. Uh, and I've been vaccinated too. And so, uh, you know, we're leading by example. I've seen plenty of our physician colleagues that have posted pictures of physician colleagues that are pregnant that have shown pictures and have gone all in to pay it forward to others and help us get out of this pandemic. So of course, talk to your doctor, but don't be afraid to get the vaccine. When you're offered it, I always tell people like, when you're, I'm telling this to my patients right now, I'm like, listen, when you're offered this vaccine, I need you to step up to the plate. Let's do it. We got to do it together. Let's switch topics. Let's talk perimenopause and menopause. I'll ask Dr. Derry this question. Dr. Derry, um, I get this question all the time. Uh, I'm, I actually had a, I had a patient in my practice on Monday, a woman who was in her early 50s, 54, and she goes, Dr. G, 
Why am I still having my, my menses? Why am I still on my period? When is it going to end? What kind of, what kind of, how do you approach women as they're, as they're in perimenopause or, or clearly still fully, fully uh, premenopausal um, or as they make the transition to menopause? Like, what do you tell women that are saying, when's it going to stop? Well, there's no magical time. Um, what I will say is the average age of menopause is in the early 50s. Um, now, um, when um, I, I, you know, there are certain uh, ethnic groups that actually menstruate longer than normal. Uh, no, I'll say longer than um, the other uh, other races. So, African American women tend to tend to have uh, longer periods, meaning that they have menses longer uh, in age and older in age. Um, I had, uh, you know, everyone is different. I had a little threshold of about 56. If a woman still have still bleeding at 56, I kind of check some hormones and make sure that she's just not having some abnormal postmenopausal bleeding. So, um, and I'll just take a second just to say what is menopause because ahead. menopause is not an age. It's actually in one count, like one whole year without a, without a menstrual cycle, if you had normal menstrual cycles. So, uh, and, and you're at the appropriate age, obviously. So um, at that point, we could call it, you know, as it says, pause and menses or menopause. Yeah. So um, that that's kind of um, that definition. Now, the time that we start to get a little concerned is if you have had over a year without a period, but then you start having periods a couple of years later, that's abnormal, okay? and. I, I really emphasize to my older women that are uh, quote unquote in menopause that you shouldn't see a speck of blood anymore. So if you do, you need to <laughs> let me know because I've had a lot of women that have had spotting in their 60s, <clears throat> excuse me. And because it wasn't like a full flow of bleeding, they thought that, nah, you know, they just kind of threw, you know, threw it in the back, in the back you're like, oh, you know, it's just a little bit of spotting. No, any bleeding <clears throat> after you've had your year of no periods and you're at an appropriate age over 50, that's not normal. And you need to have someone look at that. Thank you for, for just that thorough explanation and really helping to guide women out there. Again, this is why I love having these conversations with you both as experts in my physician network of, of friends and colleagues. But this really underscores the point that having that relationship with your doc and talking to your doc when things, you know, there's that old saying, you know, the boy who cried, cried sheep or cried wolf. Am I, am I messing it up, y'all? <laughs> the no. one that cried wolf. Cried you know, wolf. My analogies are off today, but it's all good. We're still here for you. But again, you know, you want to be like wolf, wolf. It's a boy cried wolf. Clearly, uh, as I get it, that my brain's working again. But 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 again, we don't want to miss something. It doesn't hurt to ask those questions. If something's wrong, then please ask. That's the only way that we can help. Next question. I like this one, Doctor Dennis. Here it is for you. I get asked this question all the time. Uh, I'm having hot flash symptoms. Are there any subs that I could take supplements for perimenopause or menopause? And, you know, where what do we know about that? Um, so there are lots of over-the-counter remedies that uh, can sometimes be helpful for women. And so um, uh, black cohosh is one of the, uh, the traditional over-the-counter remedies that some women try. Um, the, the, the main most evidence-based treatment for hot flashes is estrogen replacement. Um, and we always say that you want to use that estrogen replacement for the or uh, at the dose that is needed for as long as it's needed um, and not any longer than that. <laughs> um, um, because obviously there can be some concerns with long-term estrogen replacement, um, but it is the most evidence-based form of taking care of hot flashes. I do recommend that women try the over-the-counter black cohosh, uh, vitamin E, different um, uh, uh, over-the-counter remedies to see if they help. But oftentimes, if they're really suffering, we, we have to try the hormone replacement. Excellent. Here we go. Dr. Derry, I like this question. We'll do a few more, then we'll switch to another, another topic. Uh, Dr. Derry, I get asked this question uh, quite a bit. And I'm, it's interesting that I'm asked this question as an internist, but hey, it is what it is. Here we go. Here's a question. What is the recovery time from a hysterectomy? And what are the side effects of a hysterectomy? Well, um, so I will say... Um, um, so there, there are different types of hysterectomy. Well, there's, there are different types of hysterectomies, first of all. And then um, I, I'm very, uh, I really want people, women to 
advocate for themselves about what exactly is happening to you when you have surgery. Extremely commonly, we have women that say, oh yeah, I had hysterectomy. What kind of history did you, did they take your ovaries? Oh yeah, they took everything. And then you do an ultrasound and got ovaries still there. So uh, very commonly, we think that it's all a one, one package that goes away, uh, which means your uterus and both ovaries and tubes. Um, and very commonly, depending on the age that you've had a hysterectomy, that they may not have done that. And so that should be an active conversation you have with your doctor and the surgeon who's going to do your hysterectomy on what parts are you taking out because it's important. Um, we definitely take tubes out because we found that uh, taking out the fallopian tubes uh, can help prevent a different type of uh, gynae cancer. Um, and then more importantly, the, the ovaries. The ovaries hold your estrogen. That's where, you know, um, it, once those uh, ovaries are gone, the uh, chance of hot flashes and, and a lot of um, uh, menopausal symptoms uh, are, are, can be very dramatic. Um, and so uh, um, now, nowadays, uh, there, it, there is a lot of talk about preserving the ovaries, especially in younger women. So let's say, for instance, you had a hysterectomy at 45 years old, we wouldn't really want to take the ovaries out unless there was a problem with them, okay? And so you may still have your ovaries, but your uterus is, and tubes are gone. So it's very important to find out what, what, uh, what body parts got taken out of you. And um, beyond that, though, um, there's a lot of talk that people say, oh, you know, um, you know, my sexual function might change after I have a hysterectomy, that kind of thing. And there's a conversation to have with your uh, surgeon about uh, with or without leaving the cervix there. And there's, there's a lot of back and forth on that as well. Uh, however, most women still seem to have fun. So all I can say is that <laughs> at the end of the day, <laughs> um, you know, um, most of the time, if you have to, if you um, are scheduled for a hysterectomy, you need it, that hysterectomy. And so um, the, your doctor can work with you with other problems like vaginal dryness and things like that and can kind of make sure that she can, he or she can improve uh, those symptoms that can be fixed. You know, you, you made me chuckle a little bit when you said sometimes the, the girls just want to have fun. And I had a question asked to me in, um, by a patient once, and she goes, Doc, Dr. G, um, I've had a history of me and my husband were sexually active. What happens to the sperm when we are intimate? And I go, it just gets pushed back out. There you go. It just gets, it ain't got nowhere, it ain't got nowhere to go. And so we say it just gets pushed back out. Uh, just like when I see guys and they say, well, what happens to my sperm after I get a vasectomy? Well, it just gets reabsorbed. And so it just gets pushed back out with the vaginal content. So this is a great segue into sexual health. Here we go. I like these questions. Then we're going to get into myths miss versus facts, everybody, because I promise y'all we get there. And so miss versus, uh, not miss versus sex. Yeah, I got a little ahead of myself. Uh, sexual health, very important uh, topic uh, uh, for many women. Uh, and so I want to uh, kind of clear the air and certain things. And so I'll start with Dr. Dennis. Here's the question. Um, I like this one. Can you get pregnant uh, if you have sex on your period? Do we know the answer to that? So uh, if you have sex on your period, um, your chances of getting pregnant may be lower than, in, than other times of your cycle, but it's not nothing. Um, and so, um, yes, you can get pregnant um, if you have sex during your period. Um, it's not the most fertile time of your cycle, but you could still be fertile and you could still get pregnant. The thing women have to remember is that getting pregnant is just not the day of intercourse, but the sperm can stay around for uh, many days afterwards. Um, and so if you happen to release an egg or an egg is in process of being ovulated, um, and there's some sperm hanging around in there, you can get pregnant. Excellent. Here we go. I like this question. We're talking sexual health now for women. Uh, uh, Dr. Jerry, here's a question for you. Uh, what age does a woman lose interest in sex? <laughs> T3. Um, <Yeah. laughs> um, there, there is no age. And, and I will say that... Um, um, most women uh, really want to try to keep their sexual function uh, going and, and feeling good about themselves. Like, especially after hysterectomies, a lot of women, you know, they kind of go through a phase where they feel that, you know, they they may not have all of the, their sexual organs, for instance. But, but the bottom line is that, um, um, you know, 
people can can still there is no age i mean I, I, yeah i i got you on that one hey the uh, stories are, the stories are too numerous that all the, i can tell you i i, I agree with you is, the stories yes, are very absolutely numerous. it's all in what you want to participate in how about there you that go. <laughs> i think about i think about a lot of the a lot of the older men that i have my practice at are still asking for scripts for their viagra so mm -hmm. uh so we know people are still <laughs> yeah and i think that's one of the sh topics is that you know a lot of my older patients my female patients in their 70s are still interested oh, yeah. in maintaining their sexual health, having um, a healthy sex life with their partners. And so this is not a conversation that needs to stop at a certain age. It, it's an ongoing conversation to make sure that everybody is having as much fulfillment in that area as they want. I love it. I, I want to mention something ahead, too. I, I, I want to say just one quick thing too, that, um, you know, what happens sometimes is, for instance, a couple or even, um, you know, because we have seniors that are dating later in life, you know, they, they like, you know, may have lost a spouse for whatever reason, and they have not had, you know, have had not had sex for, you know, even a decade, for instance, and now they're like in their early 70s, and they finally, you know, uh, connect with somebody new and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, I'm a big proponent that when I know that my patient, once again, as uh, Dr. Gomez, you mentioned about having a relationship with your doctor, when I know my patient has has not had, in, you know, intercourse, for instance, in years, okay, and now she, she has suddenly has a new partner or her partner may not have been functioning very well, and now he's kind of got himself going, you know, together, and they're able to, to do things. I always make sure and evaluate to make sure that she doesn't have any problems because women can, you know, have some tearing, you know, other problems from not having had intercourse in a very long time, especially as women are postmenopausal, they lose that estrogen, which causes, which helps with the stretchiness of, of the uh, vulva region and, and, and the vagina. And that can sometimes get very stiff and the tissue can be very thin. And so I'm, I'm a big proponent of, you know, if that happens to, you might need some extra, you know, like estrogen cream or something just to make sure that your body is ready for that. Because if you haven't had it in a very long time, there may be, you know, some, some, uh, some complications from that. Excellent. Well, this has been a great discussion. Let's get into some myths versus facts. We can talk about that topic all day. Hey, we're having fun. Here we go. Myths versus facts. For those of you that don't know about this, I say the statement and my expert panel says myth or fact, and then they give another statement. And we're going to see if we can kind of boom, 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 boom. And you know what? I, again, might actually participate. I, I said I was going to do some things, then I kind of backed off. I did, but hey, we're going to keep it going for you. Here we go. Myth versus fact. Here's the first statement. All right. This is to Dr. Dennis. Here we go. Statement. Is it okay to drink? Sorry. I, I, I'm asking like a question. I don't even say it as a statement. My bad. Here we go. Here's a statement. It is okay to drink caffeine while pregnant. Myth or fact? Uh, it's a fact. It is okay. All right, then let's keep doing. Dr. Dare, I like this one. Uh, we probably already answered this a bit, but we'll say it again. Here's a statement. It is okay to drink alcohol while pregnant. Oh, we didn't talk about that. Um, we were talking we were talking actually breastfeeding. Sorry. <laughs> we didn't talk about that. That's the statement. Is it okay? It is okay to drink alcohol while pregnant. Myth or fact? Okay. So once again, that, that, um, <laughs> okay so i'm sorry um no so um one glass of wine um occasional is fine i i would caution women to do anything in the first trimester when you have more of like uh the development early development of the of uh, the infant but i will say that uh to make sure that that uh you know, sometimes one drink turns into four drinks, turns into six drinks. And so I, that's the, that's the main disclaimer that I always say one glass of wine. Yes. You All know, right. go, going to a bears game. No. <laughs> Excellent. Here we go. I love this one. Hey, uh, next statement here, Dr. Dennis, I like those, don't like this one. Here we go. We just talked about it. Statement. Older women cannot have sex. Myth or fact. That is a myth. All righty then, I agree. Next that we just already talked about. It. Here's the next statement. I like this one. Uh, statement, Dr. Derry, here we go. I should be concerned about getting the COVID-19 vaccine if I plan on becoming pregnant. I should be concerned about getting the vaccine if I plan on becoming pregnant, myth or fact? Myth. Please explain. We'll do a quick explanation um, on that one again. 
Right. Well, the reason why is because it would it would be better to get vaccinated before you get pregnant as opposed to waiting till you are pregnant, even though uh, the recommendations to get vaccinated are um, open for all women that are pregnant currently and women that are lactating. So definitely, if you're, if you're not even pregnant, please get the vaccine. All right, here we go. I'm going to take this one. I like this one. I'll give myself the easy one, y'all. Why not? There we go. It's all like underhand pitches. Here we go. Myth effect for Dr. G myself. Here we go. Here's a statement. Heart disease runs in my family. So there is nothing I can do to prevent it. That is a myth. There are so many things that you can do to help lower your risk of heart disease. Subscribe to the Foundations of Lifestyle Medicine. Move more eat better, stress less, sleep. Sleep is so important. Sleep affects every single health system, organ system in the body. But there are many things that we can do to be active and healthy and lower our risk for heart disease. Here we go. Next statement, Dr. Dennis. I like this one. Statement, exercise is too risky if a woman has heart disease. Myth or fact? Uh, I would say that's a myth. Please explain. Uh, obviously, we want our, our patients who have uh, heart disease or at risk for heart disease be as healthy as possible. And so you want to work with your doctor if you have heart disease that's already established to talk about an exercise regimen that is safe for you. And so it may start off with low intensity exercise, walking. Um, you have those stationary things that you can move your arms. There's lots of different tools and resources we out, have out there to get people moving. And so heart disease should not stop you, but talk to your doctor. Wonderful. Here we go. We'll do a couple more of these. Dr. Terry, I like this statement. Here's a statement. Myth or fact. Women should have a pap smear every year. Myth or fact. Myth. Please explain. Uh, well, the current recommendations are um, uh, that if you're over the age of 30, uh, depending on the, the, uh, your pap smear results, you can actually not have a pap smear for up to five years. All right. Love it. Here we go. I'm going to do this one. I'll give myself an easy one again, y'all. See what I'm doing to y'all? That's how. That's that's what you call friendship, without a doubt. <laughs> Here we go. I'll do the statement for Dr. G. Easy one. Statement. Heart disease is the number one killer of women. The answer is that is a fact. And there are so many things that we can do to lower risk. We have to have these conversations in order to really make measurable action and measurable differences. But first, by having this conversation, we can't just talk about heart disease on one day. Typically, the first day of February is Go Red for Women Day by the American Heart Association. We have to talk about it every day. Here we go, a couple more of these. Statement, this is for Dr. Dr. Dennis. I like this one. Um, statement, new moms should rest for an entire month after giving birth, myth or fact was resting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, 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 I love it. Well, there's the answer right there. You ain't rested. I like it. <laughs> so, so you'll say that's a myth and please explain. As much rest as you can. Please get as much rest as you can. Take care of yourself. <laughs> I, like, I like it. Here we go. We'll do one more here. I like this one. This is for Dr. Derry. Myth or fact. All right. Statement. You must live with hot flashes, even if they make you miserable. Myth or fact. That's a myth. Please explain. Um, well, uh, there is medication to help people who have hot flashes. Occasionally, there are some people that can't take certain medications, but working with your doctor, there are a lot of different ways that we can try to, no one has to live in misery. And, uh, and a lot of women think that they do. And that is not part of, um, it, it may be something that happens to you uh, later in life, but it's not something that you have to suffer with. So there is medication to help. You have to tell your doctor that because um, so, some women are really suffering with that. Wonderful. Thank you. So there you have it, yeah, everybody. Myth or facts. Hey, we got about five minutes left. This has just been an awesome conversation, really talking about health issues that women avoid talking about. And so we're talking about it for you. And again, the best thing you can do is share this show with everybody you know, spread the word, pay it forward. So we're going to wrap things up. I'm going to start with Dr. Dennis. And I'm going to say, that here's the kind of question. Dr. Dennis, you know, we've been talking about various, you know, a lot of broad topics that affect women and their health and their livelihoods on a day-to-day -day basis. We're talking engagement and just talking clarification of a lot of issues. But but give me give me kind of a few take-home points out there for women to be successful about their health. You know, what should they be getting from our discussion today and how can they apply that in their daily lives? I would say a few take-home points is to be your own advocate. Um, to make sure if you have a concern, if you have a problem, 
or you just need more information that you find someone or you find the means to get the best information possible to take care of your health. And sometimes women are hesitant. Uh, they don't want to seem pushy or inconvenience people. No, I, that's my job. It's our job in the health system to hear your issues, to work it out, to figure out what's going on to, to get you to better health. Um, the, the last point is to make sure that you find a good primary care physician um, so that you can develop that relationship, so you can have that partnership of trust over time, um, so that you, as you grow older, you're beginning to, to address, prevent issues and address them as they come up. I think those are kind of my key take-home points. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. Dr. Derry, give us a few take-home points when it comes to today's theme of getting women more comfortable to talk about their health issues and to have success when they're uh, trying to uh, live as healthy as they can be. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I would, I would echo what Dr. Dennis said. And I think that, um, once again, being an advocate for yourself, um, you know, for instance, breast cancer, you know, or if you feel a lump, you know, don't, you know, don't just ignore it, you know, don't ignore your body. A lot of women uh, put themselves last. They, they take care of everyone else, their kids, their husband, their other family members, take care of everyone else. And then they put themselves last. And part of the reason is I have to take care of everyone else. And all I will say is that if you're down, then no one gets taken care of then. So you have to take care of yourself be it an investment, make your health an investment to yourself because it's worth it. Your family depends on you. Your, all your loved ones, people that you care about, they depend on you. So the, the gift you give to them is having health. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Derry. I want to thank Dr. Saisha Dennis, Dr. Kimberly Derry. Before we get my final thoughts, I want to just give a shout out. Listener, healthy, oh yeah, content. Here's a, here's a statement from A.B., Here's a statement. Got my mammogram last week. Does that count? Well, AB, it absolutely does count. It shows that you're intentional in your health. And you're taking advantage of the opportunity you have. Engagement is paramount in what you're doing. So thank you, AB, and spread that message forward to others out there to go ahead and get their mammograms. So my final thoughts are this. You know, we've been having this great conversation about women's health and about being more open and being able to talk to your physician about health. Again, no question is off limits, certainly for my patients and certainly for even Dr. Derry and Dr. Dennis. I want to be that person to help you achieve your goals. The first step that I want you to do is take that leap of faith. Believe in yourself. Don't be afraid to ask those questions because, you know, we might learn some things and then be able to apply them. Our job as physicians are to coach you to be better versions of yourself. And I think we take your health seriously, and many of you do, but we can always look at this as an opportunity to improve. So I just say, stay engaged, keep it going. It's okay to have uh, regressions when it comes to your health but know what you want to do. Progress is going to be there. Stick with a fantastic doctor and use the resources, use your community. It takes a village to reach your health goals and your life goals too. So I want to thank again, Dr. Kimberly Derry, board certified obstetrician gynecologist, chief medical officer at Elmer's Hospital, Edward Elmer's Health, Dr. Saisha Dennis, assistant professor, Department of Family and Community Medicine, Community Medicine Curriculum Director, University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. You've been listening to to and watching Health 360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producers are Tiffany E.R. Gomez and Sarah Zwack. Audio and video production specialist is Mike Paskey. Copyright 2021, Edward Elmer's Health, all rights reserved. For more awesome health information, visit me at health360podcast.com and follow me across all social media at health 360 Dr. G. Hey, this is Dr. G signing off. Stay well, everybody, and peace out.